Hi, this is Greg Cook, your Chem 240 instructor. Let's get started with the next video. In this video, we're going to talk about acids and bases. And chapter 2 is a rather short chapter, so we should be able to cover the whole chapter in one video. Uh, so let's begin. Um, talking about acids, there are several different definitions of acids, and I want to talk about those definitions a little bit. Uh, the early idea about an acid came from a scientist named Arrhenius, who defined an acid as something which produces a proton or an H plus ion. Now we know that H plus ions don't just exist without having it attached to something, and in particular water. So the Arrhenius definition of an acid actually came to include the formation of hydronium ions in water. So the deprotonation of an acid uh, by water would produce a hydronium ion. So a substance that ionizes in water to give protons associated with those water molecules. And in contrast, the base, an Arrhenius base, is a substance which ionizes in water to give hydroxide ions. So sodium hydroxide, where M here might be sodium, potassium hydroxide, the metal indicated here would be potassium. We have another definition of acid and base put forward by Bronsted and Lowry, and that definition is that a substance that donates a proton is considered an acid, or a Bronsted-Lowry acid. And a substance which accepts a proton is a Bronsted-Lowry base. And in actuality, we think about these um, acid-base reactions as equilibria, so let me draw the equilibrium arrow here. Acid HA indicated in this equation is a generic acid. A could be any kind of uh, partner for that that acid. Um, it could be an OH in the terms of water, it could be chloride in HCl, it could be many things. So in this case what's happening is HA, the acid, is being uh, deprotonated by the base water, so wa the lone pair of water takes the proton from HA. That generates what we refer to as the conjugate base or the anion from the original acid. Uh, as well as the hydronium ion, which we refer to as the conjugate acid. So the initial base has become the conjugate acid when it's protonated by the acid. Now this equilibrium is described by an equilibrium constant, and specifically with, when we're talking about Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases, we're talking about uh, Ka, which is the same as K equilibrium for this reaction. Uh, but we refer to this as the acidity constant, the acidity constant. And we'll come back to that in a moment when we talk about acid and base strength and how we measure that. But you notice that this equilibrium depends on the concentration of the products over the reactants. In this case, it's the concentration of hydronium ion and A- minus over the acid. Okay, when we talk about Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases, there are several things to keep in mind that we have acids and bases of all different acid, uh, strengths and they can be either uh, positively charged, negatively charged, or neutral in, in case of an acid that can give up a proton and a base that can accept a proton while it's possible to have things that are positively charged except a proton, it's much, much less common. So bases generally are negatively charged or neutral species. It could be, for example, OH minus, hydroxide ion could be a base, or water as we saw in the previous slide, H2O is a neutral molecule where the water is acting as the base in that equilibrium. Uh, we can have acids with more than one acidic proton, and of course each deprotonation of a species that has more than one acidic proton could have different acid strengths for each of those. But we could have monoprotic acids such as um, HCl, hydrochloric acid would be monoprotic. Diprotic, sulfuric acid is H2SO4, so there are actually two different hydrogens that could come off. It could react with a base, and I'll be generic here, base, uh, to take off one proton, in which case you'll get HB plus HSO4 minus, and then that species could react with another base to take the other proton off to form SO4 2 minus plus another HB. So in this case, that is a diprotic acid, sulfuric acid. Now, the acid strength for the first reaction and the acid strength for the second reaction will be different, but it can give up two protons given the pro right base for it to react with. Now whether a molecule acts as an acid or a paste depends entirely on what it's reacting with, and we'll see an example of that in a moment. 
Um, as you saw from the previous slide, water acted as a base, and I'll show you an example where water acts as an acid because it's reacting with something which is a stronger base than it. Another thing to keep in mind is that the stronger the acid, the weaker its conjugate base will be. So the anion that's generated by deprotonating that acid, the conjugate base, will be weaker or more stable if the acid is stronger. Those two go hand in hand. The stronger the acid, the more stable or weaker the conjugate base that's generated from that acid. Okay, here are some examples of various acids that we can encounter. You can see there are all kinds of different acids here from stronger to weaker, uh, hydrogen halides, hyd uh, hydrogen sulfates, um, you can see neutral acids, negatively charged acids. In this case, uh, the acid strength here is going from greatest at the top and, and weaker towards the bottom. So weak acids at the bottom, stronger acids at the top. And you can see, for example, uh, let's take sulfuric acid. As you uh, take sulfuric acid and it reacts to form HSO4 minus, as I said, that can also be an acid. So you can see it's a weaker acid, which could then produce the sulfate ion. So notice the acid, the conjugate base that's generated from that acid. In this case, it's a diprotic, so it could be a, behave as an acid again. Um, HI, for example, and its conjugate base after the proton is delivered to something else uh, forms I minus, the conjugate base. This is going to be more stable or weaker at the top for the conjugate base. This is going to be weaker and more stable at the top for the conjugate base that's generated from those acid. As the acid gets weaker, the conjugate base is going to be less stable, more reactive. So those are some trends that you should keep in mind when you're thinking about acid-base reactions and what reacts with what. So if you look at this whole this chart, um, you can see that uh, water is a weaker acid than say something like hydrochloric acid is. So if you mix those two together, water is actually going to behave as a base to deprotonate HCl. It's a stronger acid. HCl isn't going to take a proton from water. HCl will not act as a base. Um, so there are several things that one can think about here in terms of uh, the reactivity, um, and what you react with. Okay, I said I would show you an example of where a species can act either as an acid or a base. So if we take something like HCl and react that with H2O, H2O can act as the base in this case, deprotonate HCl, and you generate Cl- as the conjugate base plus H3O plus hydronium ion. So in this case, water is acting as a base. However, if you put water in the presence of an even stronger base, such as this amide anion, NH2 minus, okay, then it's the NH2 minus which is going to act as the base. This is water is going to act as an acid. So please let me clear this slide and I'll draw that for you. So in this case, we're going to have the base here and the acid here. What kind of reaction will ensue? Well, the, one of these lone pairs on nitrogen are going to take that proton off of water, break that bond, the electrons will stay with the OH, and we will form a neutral ammonia molecule. And an OH minus. Okay, so this is now the conjugate acid, NH3 and the conjugate base, OH minus. Okay, so depending on what water it reacts with, it can behave as either an acid or a base. In order to be a base, you have to have some kind of electron lone pair to accept a proton. In order to be an acid, in the Bronsted-Lowry sense, you have to have a proton to give up to that negative a lone pair. Okay, when we talk about acid strength, again, we're talking about an equilibrium reaction between the reaction of an acid and base with its conjugate acid and conjugate base. And so depending on the strength of the acid or base on one side of the equation to the other side of the equation, um, we can have different equilibria established. And again, this is um, equilibrium constant in this case when we're talking about acid-base reactions is the acidity constant. That's defined by the concentrations of the right side of the equation, in this case hydronium ion and A minus, over the acid concentration on the left. We often express this value, this, this acidity constant, as a pKa, or the minus log of the Ka. 
So it's actually an inverse relationship. And uh, in a pKa sense, each pKa unit is about a tenfold difference in acid strength. And keep in mind, as the pKa number gets lower, that equates to a stronger acid. Okay, stronger acid. And also a weaker conjugate base or a more stable conjugate base. Keep in mind that these all are related to each other. It just depends on what perspective you are considering those from. So the degree to which you get ionization or acid-base reactions or, or equilibrium to the right or to the left in this equation depends a lot on which side has the stronger, stronger and weaker acids. We can use that to predict various reactions. So let's take a look at some pKa values here, shall we? If we take a look at these particular acids here, in this case we have a neutral acid HCl. Uh, you can see that it's a very strong acid. The pKa here is the lowest. Um, in this particular chart uh, at minus 3.9 pKa units. Compare that with water with a pKa of about 16. Now that's a big difference in reactivity. We're talking what? 10 to the 20 difference in reactivity between water as an acid and HCl. So obviously um, if you're going to do a reaction where you form water or you form HCl, it's going to lie on the side closest to the weaker or the more stable or weaker acids. Notice water in the protonated state or hydronium is a strong acid as well. HF is a little bit weaker. We'll talk about some of those differences in a minute. Um, here is acetic acid. It has a pKa of about 5. More acidic than water. So all of these acids that I've shown here as examples are more acidic than water. Here are some more pKa values for you to consider and all the ones I've listed here are less acidic than water. Water in this case is the strongest acid on the chart. So um, I want to show you the other side of that spectrum. For example, we compare water to alcohols. Alcohols are just slightly less acidic than water. They have similar acidities because they have similar functional groups, an OH functional group, which has a proton to provide as an acid. Notice that um, certain functional groups that are polarized, we know that a CO double bond is polarized in this direction, so there's a lot of positive charge character here. That makes the adjacent hydrogen somewhat acidic, and so that can act as an acid by taking that proton off, but it's a, very, it's a pretty weak acid, um, definitely a weaker acid than water. Ammonia, a much, much weaker acid than water. And if you think about an alkane, an alkane is extremely difficult to deprotonate. As a matter of fact, there is no base known that can deprotonate um, methane or alkanes very easily because this is such an unstable anion, this conjugate base. But now, pKa values can help us predict the equilibrium state for a particular acid-base reaction. So whether the reaction lies on the right side or the left side, will depend on the specific strengths and the relative strengths of the acids on the left and the conjugate acid on the right. So the reaction will be favored to lie on the side of the weaker or more stable species. We can see that in this particular example. So if I take ethanol, which is this molecule all the way on the left, ethanol has a pKa value of 16. It's about the same pKa or acid strength as water. Uh, and if we react that with an acetate anion, uh, in this particular reaction, if I'm going from left to right, this uh, ethanol would behave as in the acid, and the acetate would behave as the base. So we would have a reaction which would occur something like this. The proton would be transferred to acetate to form acetic acid on the right and ethoxide as the conjugate base of ethanol being deprotonated. Now notice the pKa of acetic acid is at 4.7. So which of these is the stronger acid? Ethanol or acetic acid? Well, acetic acid is. Remember, the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid. And so that tells us that the equilibrium will lie on the left side and the right side will be uh, less concentration. So this equilibrium should lie pretty far on the left side because there's quite a bit difference in the acidities of those two particular proton containing species, the one on the left and the one on the right. Okay, so what kind of factors are involved in 
making something more or less acidic than something else or more a stronger or weaker acid? Well, there are several factors. Of course, if you're going to behave as a Bronsted acid or a Bronsted Lowry acid, it has to be able to give up the proton. In order to give up the proton, it has to have a stabilized conjugate base to help that. That would make it easier to give up that proton. So you need to think about both of those concepts. So of course one aspect of this is how strong is the bond between the hydrogen and the other species that would be generating the conjugate base. And you can see here in this trend we have halogens, HF, HCl, HBr and HI and as you go to the right you get uh, weaker HX bonds and stronger acids. It can give up that proton more easily. Also uh, the conjugate base in this case for example would be I minus that's a much larger more spread out a species because the atom is larger the electrons are more delocalized and that always leads to greater stability so the conjugate base is also more stable that has to do with both electronegativity, stability of the conjugate base, as well as the delocalization of electrons, either by size they're spread out more, or we talked about this concept of resonance last chapter. That also has an effect on acidity. So electronegative atoms. The more electronegative to the atom, the greater its ability to accept electrons or be, uh, be stable as a negatively charged species. And you can see that electronegativity has a huge impact on the acidity. If you're to compare methane, where C- carbon uh, would be a conjugate base, it's much less electronegative than nitrogen, which is still difficult. It's got a very, very high pKa and a weak acid, but definitely it's a stronger acid ammonia than CH4. Um, water is a stronger acid because oxygen is even more electronegative than nitrogen. And HF, the most electronegative atom, is the strongest acid in this series. So you can see how electronegativity plays a role in making an acid weaker or stronger. And it has to do with the ability to stabilize the negative charge once it's given up the proton. Okay, electronegativity also has an impact through more than just one bond. So not just directly related to the bond to the hydrogen that's being given up, the proton, but also further away. So if you see, for example, this molecule acetic acid, uh, with various substitutions, you can see a change in the acid strength depending on what this group X is. So if X is a hydrogen, the pKa is 4.7. As you get more and more electronegative atoms placed on there, the, the acid strength gets greater. So you get stronger acids as you go down in this particular table. That's because this electronegative atom is polarizing the bond. And that polarization puts a po partially positive charge here. So if you generate a negative charge when you deprotonate that acetic acid to make acetate, the more plus charge or partial plus charge you get closer to this, or the more you can uh, withdraw electron density by having a more electronegative atom, the greater the stability will be for the negative charge. When this is happening all through single bonds, we refer to this as the inductive effect. Inductive effect. Inductive effect is a polarization or a uh, spreading out of charge or stabilizing charge, negative charge, through sigma bonds. It's not that that negative charge is actually moving over, but because you are putting more positive charge closer to it, it's helping to stabilize it. So that's an inductive effect, and we can see that effect further away than the specific H bond we're breaking. Now that effect drops off dramatically as you get further and further away. So the more sigma bonds you go through, further away from that site of reactivity, the less impact it will have. Notice if we put three fluorines on here, it has almost three times the, the effect. If you put one fluorine versus three fluorines, you go from a pK of 2.6 to a pKa of 0.5. So these electronegativity inductive effects are additive. Okay, spreading out of charge is also a stabilizing effect when we talk about resonance. So if we think about the phenoxide ion, remember what the pKa of water or the pKa of alcohol was. It's around 16. Notice the pKa of phenol that's shown here is around 10. It's about 10 to the 5 times stronger acid than water. So or 10 to the 6 times stronger acid than water. 6 pKa units difference. So why is that? Well if you 
carry out the acid base reaction, let's take a look at the conjugate base that's generated by doing that. So if I take OH base and I deprotonate uh, that phenol and make, by the way, the byproduct here is water, um, and I generate this phenoxide ion, okay, why is that ion, that anion, more stable than, say, water? If I were to take water and react it with a base, we would generate hydroxide ion. Why is this phenoxide ion more stable? Well, uh, it has to do with the fact that that negative charge that's generated is delocalized through resonance. So let's take a look at this. So remember, if I have a negative charge adjacent to a pi bond, I can draw a resonance form where that negative charge is over on this carbon, which would look something like this. Now notice I put a double bond from the carbon to oxygen and push the electrons from the pi bond in the ring up onto the adjacent carbon. I can continue that, so if I take these electrons and form a double bond here and shift the electrons from that pi bond up onto the carbon. I can draw a resonance form which looks like this. And I can continue that around as well and put the negative charge on that carbon. So the negative charge exists there. And I can even go back directly to that structure from this one by pushing the electrons down to form a double bond between the carbons and breaking the CO double bond and putting electrons up on the oxygen. So notice that in this case the phenoxide ion, the negative charge that's generated by deprotonating phenol, is spread out among one oxygen and three different carbons. So it's very much delocalized and stabilized through this resonance. And that has a big impact on the acid strength and the stability of the conjugate base that's generated. We see this effect of resonance and acidity also on other areas too. I mean just comparing an alcohol like ethanol has a pKa of 16 versus acetic acid which has a pKa close to 5 um, and that's because if you react with the base and deprotonate it, the anion in this case of the top is completely localized on the oxygen. It can't be spread out through resonance. Whereas if you make the acetate ion you can take that negative charge and delocalize it through resonance to the other oxygen. So that charge is spread out, it's more stable than the uh, ethoxide ion and in this case then that, uh, that leads to a greater acidity or greater ability to give up the proton to generate that conjugate base. So resonance has a big impact on acidity. So there's another definition of acid that we need to talk about because this is a little different than the Arrhenius or the Bronsted-Lowry definitions. And that's what we refer to as the Lewis definition for acids. And in a nutshell, uh, a Lewis acid is defined as a substance that accepts a pair of electrons. In other words, it forms a covalent bond. Okay, with a pair of electrons. So it's something that can take, accept a pair of electrons. Usually that means it has to have some kind of an empty orbital or plus, plus charge. A Lewis base, in contrast, is a substance that donates a pair of electrons. Again, these form some kind of a covalent bond. So here's a generic description of that. A Lewis base usually is something with a, a lone pair of electrons. Whether that has a charge or not is irrelevant, as long as you have a lone pair of electrons. It can donate that or form a bond to some species which has an empty orbital to form a bond with. So when we think about Lewis acids and bases, it's a broader definition of acids and bases of which something like a Bronsted-Lowry acid and base is a subset. So if you think about it, let's just take our, our reaction of HCl and water. Okay, this Bronsted-Lowry acid which is um, HCl and the Bronsted-Lowry base, which is water, um, is uh, by definition also considered a Lewis acid and Lewis base because the Lewis acid is something which accepts an electron pair and forms a covalent bond and the Lewis base is something that donates an electron pair and forms a covalent bond. So in this case the water lone pair is the Lewis base reacting with the proton which is accepting that lone pair or those electrons to form a new covalent bond. So the product of this is the hydronium ion 
and then the conjugate base is Cl minus. So this is the Lewis base because it's donating a pair of electrons and this is the Lewis acid because that hydrogen has accepted the pair of electrons. So why do we have to have this broader definition of Lewis acid and Lewis base? Well, the reason is because there are many other types of electron donating and electron accepting systems that we can consider. So for example, let's say we have a carbon with a plus charge. And let me just give, for example, this molecule. This is what we call a carbocation. We're going to talk about this a lot when we talk about alkene reactivity. A carbocation, it's a carbon which is missing one bond and missing some electrons, so it has a formal plus charge. We could react that with something like uh, Cl minus, okay, chloride ion. In this case, chloride ion reacts with this carbocation to form a new bond. So that lone pair is being donated to the empty orbital on the carbon, and that generates a new covalent bond, the carbon chlorine bond. So we form this chlorinated hydrocarbon. Although it's an example of an addition reaction of chloride to the carbocation, it's also considered to be a Lewis acid and Lewis base relationship because the chloride gave up its lone pair or donated its lone pair to form a new bond and the carbon accepted the lone pair to form a new bond. That is an example of what we would define as a Lewis acid and Lewis base. Another example is uh, things like some of the metals coordinating two groups. So let me just take, for example, boron trifluoride. Now we haven't talked a lot about boron yet, but boron trifluoride is uh, just to the left of carbon on the periodic table. It has an empty orbital which happens to be an unhybridized P. Empty orbital. Okay. And so it and it doesn't have an octet. So it could easily accept a pair of electrons to form a complex uh, which could be stabilized by an octet. Although that does generate formal charges. We'll talk a lot about this later at some point too. But if you think about something like ammonia with a lone pair, it has a lone pair which can donate to that empty orbital. In this case, boron will form a bond to the ammonia, covalent bond, and form a complex. Now, there will be formal charges. Overall, it's going to be neutral because we had a neutral species plus a neutral species. Um, although we have a nitrogen with a plus and a boron with a formal minus, overall the molecule is neutral. But that is a definition of a Lewis acid and a Lewis base coming together and forming a new covalent bond. A lone pair is donated from ammonia and accepted by the boron. These are all examples of our definition of Lewis acid and Lewis base. And you notice this doesn't really fit with a bronsted lowry or Arrhenius definition which is talking specifically about protons being transferred from one to another.